let's talk just briefly about the, the familiar and, and the, versus the new in okay. fantasy. I mean, there yeah. are the tropes. Right. Um, I had a conversation. Um, I got the opportunity to have lunch once with Tom Doherty, ah. and we talked yeah. about the degree to which a lot of fantasy has some familiarity to it. Yeah. And it was his view that people love that story, right. and so they want to return to it. Um, I hear a lot of new fantasists talk about they would no sooner you know, use those tropes than slit their wrists or something dramatic like that. Yeah. How do you, I mean, not that maybe as you sit to actually create the story, you think about that consciously, right. but as you step back you know, and you, you're able to look at a, at a fantasy, very often you can find those tropes even by, in books that are being described as, um, wow, that's completely fresh. Right. Um, how do you think about the, the old versus the new? Um, it is um, the, the familiar and the strange is how it's sometimes put. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an old Hollywood adage, blending the familiar and the strange, the strange attractor, um, they will call it. That's why you hear all the Hollywood pitches. If you ever, you know, the cliched Hollywood pitch is, you know, this meets this, where the right. f two familiars blend it together in a strange way, and you've got the familiar and the strange. Um, and that's, that's what this concept is, and how much familiar do you put in, how much strange do you put in. Um, and I do fall a little bit more on the side of um, the strange, but not as far as some other people. I mean, there are authors that are certainly going much further than I am. Um, if you read, um, if you read China Mieville, for instance, he's much more over on the strange side. We've got to do new and different things, and, um, and um, a lot of the slipstream authors like Jay Lake are doing that as well. Yeah. Um, me, I love epic fantasy, and when I when I wrote, sit down to write mine, my What's consciously going through my mind is I want people to feel, I want, I want to give people that same feeling of awesomeness that I felt when I picked up the first epic fantasies that I read, yeah. but I don't want to tell the same stories. Um, and so where is that line? It's going to be different for everybody. It's going to be different for every reader. Yeah. Um, I am very personally tired of the familiar story. Um, I don't want to tell that familiar, familiar story. Um, I don't want to read that familiar story because I've read a lot of great authors doing that. And there are probably lots of great authors still doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I've, I've already read that story enough. And it, but you'll notice what happened with, um, with Christopher Paolini's um, Aragon. Um, Aragon came out and, um, you know, not making any value judgment myself at all because, um, number one, Christopher Paolini is an awesome guy and um, this isn't about his, his story, it's about the community. You'll notice that the established science fiction fantasy readers all said, ah, this is just Star Wars mixed with Anne McCaffrey. We've read this all before, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the books took off and were explosively popular among the people who hadn't read those. Um, and who's to say that their new exploration of those tropes, it was new to them, the kids who were reading it, and who's to say that you know they latched onto it Lucas didn't invent these tropes. That's right. Um, and, you know, Star Wars came along. I'm sure there were people that when they saw Star Wars were like, blah, 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 I have seen this all before. And yet for those it was new to, it was, it was majestically powerful. Right. Um, and you get, you get Aragon doing the same thing where the old crowd is like, yeah, I've, I've been there, I've done that. And the new crowd saying, this is wonderful, this is, this is amazing because it's using the old tropes um, in a really good way. Yeah. Um, and so... That's, you know, you're just getting into personal preference there. And for me, um, the old tropes, um, I want to see them, I want to see them very much twisted on their head before I'm probably going to enjoy them. Yeah. Um, this actually came from uh, someone that uh, sourced off of my Facebook. Wanted to know, are you going to be returning to the Elantris universe? Uh, someday, I will. I can't promise when. Okay. Uh, the, the series was plotted out at three books. Um, they are loose sequels, however, meaning uh, the characters from the first book may return but will not be viewpoint characters. Um, other characters will be viewpoint characters for the sequels. Okay, good. Um, what was the most challenging part of writing this book for you? Um, Way of Kings, what was the most challenging? Boy, um, that word challenging, I mean, it can mean lots of different things. Sure. In some ways, it was challenging. I mean, I've been working on it for 20 years now. Uh, in some ways, the most challenging part was becoming a good enough author to finally tell the story that I've been wanting to tell for so long, and that's a process that took 20 years. Yeah. Um, so you could say that's the most challenging, but that's nebulous. Um, working on the latest draft of it, uh, the biggest challenge I had was making, uh, making one of the characters work. Uh, there was just a character who wasn't growing the right way, and I had to 
rewrite and rewrite and rewrite until I got that character working. And so hopefully now, when people read it, I can't tell which of them it was. Um, but there was, a, there was a very challenging aspect to that as doing it. Yeah. Um, so another writer I know you know, I was having a conversation with around themes, um, Dave Wolverton. Okay. Um, and we were talking about, you know, sometimes you can go back and you can look at something you've written and, and find that themes have kind of organically grown and mm -hmm. maybe you nourish them once you find them happening. Yeah. Um, do you ever set out with, with theme in mind or does theme happen? Theme happens for me. Um, very rarely do I start out with theme in mind. Occasionally I do. Um, occasionally, basically it, it depends on if there's a character that's passionate about something. From the start I know, you know, the core of this character is going to be something that that is, that is thematic and there's no escaping that. Yeah. Um, and in that case, I go into it knowing. Um, but it's really what the story demands. I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write a story to tell this morale detail, yeah, yeah. Um, which some authors do, and that's fine. I mean, it's essentially what, um, essentially what C.S. Lewis did, um, is he found a great metaphor to match the theme he wanted to tell a story about. Um, I'm more on the grow my themes, but really grow my characters and see what they're passionate about, and then that becomes my theme. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is a bit of a, a heavy question. Um, at least it is for me. Um, I'm a dad. I have a couple of kids. Uh -huh. um, there was a story, I guess, a couple of years ago about a, a, a guy who posted an ad, basically mm -hmm. um, something to the effect of he wanted to have someone over for dinner, and he meant literally. And someone mm -hmm. answered the ad and was eaten. Okay. Um, and so I started, and, and out of that grows this notion of semantic contagion, that some okay. ideas should not really sort of be put out there. Okay. Because they can be dangerous. In that vein, are there, are there certain topics that you simply wouldn't write about. And in my mind, I think about things like pedophilia. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there was a, a film called The Woodsman with Kevin mm -hmm. Bacon, and he played a pedophile. And I thought, it is, for me, simply impossible to make that mm -hmm. person sympathetic. Or, or, or is it no holds barred and then maybe edit later? Boy, uh, that is a deep and complex question that requires perhaps more thought than I can. We can, we can hear yeah. later no, on. No, 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 no. I mean, more thought than I can give in an interview like this. For sure, for sure. Um, I mean... My personal philosophy is that um, while there are appropriate times to censor content, um, ideas should not be censored. Um, that doesn't mean that it's bad to self-censor if there are certain things that you don't want to be involved in. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So, um, for instance, I, I don't think forbidding those ideas to be expressed is a good way to go because someone has to make the value judgment of, these ideas can be expressed and these can't. Yeah. Um, and that, I don't think, is something I want to have in the hands of any mere mortal, um, if that makes any sense. For sure. Um, and yet, certain things, say, saying as a parent, for instance, these ideas I don't want my child to expose, I think, are within your rights as a parent yeah. um, to say that. And that way you can make what decisions for your children, I can make decisions for my children, um, but the ideas are not forbidden from being expressed. That doesn't mean there are certain things that um, that content that should not be allowed. Ideas are one thing. Content is something else. That's and, a good distinction. You know, there are there are times when um, when in order to cr to ex to express some ideas in a content sort of way, it requires you know I mean killing someone on camera is an obviously gross violation of someone's rights. Writing an essay about why it should be okay to kill someone on camera, well I'm going to think that you're crazy and wrong you should be allowed to write. to write and express your ideas. Yeah. Um, so I guess this comes around to your question of do, when do I self-censor? I do self-censor um, myself. There are things that I have not chosen, I, I choose not to write about, but it's more a growth of who I am. I never sit down and say, oh, I don't want to write that. Right. It's more, uh, I'm not interested in writing that because it's not something, um, you know, that's, that, that my mind focuses on. It's not something that um, is interesting to me. And so, not part um, of your worldview. Yeah, not right? part of my worldview. And I, I do tend to, therefore, if I'm going to do that, generally stay away from the topic entirely because mm -hmm. I feel that if I'm going to, for instance, if I were going to include a pedophile, um, it would probably be, be required of myself by my own kind of um, code as a writer to express that pedophile's views as accurately as I can to make that character real, mm -hmm. that's not interesting to me. I don't think I'm going to go there. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, I can, I can express someone who wants to rule the world 
for re legitimate reasons. You know, I want to rule the world because only I can protect it or something like that. That's a terrible thing that they are doing and they are doing awful things in order to achieve that. But I can express their views as accurately as they would want me to mm -hmm. and not feel... Um, like you have to take a shower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I hear you.